Greetings from the Iowa Beef Center. I'm Patrick Wall, ISU Extension Beef Specialist coming to Southeast Iowa. In this segment of the Heifer Development Series, we're going to talk about genetic considerations for young cows, particularly those two and three year olds, and how to retain and keep them in the herd, and, and maybe some breed, breeding considerations on how to get them mated correctly. So the two year old cow uh, is arguably the most important female to get bred for a number of reasons, but obviously we have as many or more fertility challenges in the two and three year old cow, uh, especially in our heavier milking daughters that uh, maybe didn't get access to as much feed as they needed uh, given the pecking order and, or hierarchy in the herd on how, they, uh, how much access they had to, to feed. Calling young cows devastates profit. Uh, math right now has us in that five, six, and maybe even seven year old range before a cow uh, is in the black, if you will. Uh, so getting them young cows back in and ma maintaining them into the herd is really important. It's critical for herd expansion. Uh, if we're going to grow Iowa's cow herd and abroad, we need to get these young females rebred uh, and maintain our cow herd size so we can expand. And obviously her second calf should be the target of your program. Uh, she is where you're headed and getting her mated correctly uh, if you're, especially if you're retaining heifers in your program, uh, we need to make sure that our young cows uh, are where we're going and that they're doing the job and, and moving our herd the way we need it to go uh, so we can reach some of our goals from a, a profitability standpoint. So what decisions do we have to make? Well, we do have some information to go on uh, since she did calve as a two-year-old. Uh, you know, what was her birth weight, calving E score? Did she have it on her own? Uh, what kind of vigor did the calf of? Some folks are scoring uh, calf vigor. Did they get up and nurse? Uh, how was she from a mothering ability standpoint? Were there any disposition issues with that? Uh, maybe she was a little too protective or, or even dangerous around calving time. And then how did her udder hold up? Uh, a lot of folks, especially in the Hereford breed, are doing some udder scoring with an EPD being developed for udder score. And, obviously, and then we also need to look at the uh, milk versus fleshing ability. Uh, there's a trade-off there. Heavy milking cows tend to lose body condition. Uh, so given the resources that we have, did she maintain enough body flesh uh, or did she offer enough milk uh, for the weaning weight that we're desiring? And then her calving date. Uh, did she calve to her AI date if you're using an ester sync protocol? Uh, from a natural service standpoint, is she one of the earlier calving cows or did she fall back into the herd uh, and, and maybe calve later? And that might affect our decision on what we do with her from a mating standpoint. What breed complements her shortfalls and my program? And this really depends on, on where you're headed uh, from a, from a crossbreeding standpoint. Are you going to retain heifers from this female? Uh, is she in a terminal cross situation? Are you in a three breed rotation where you're constantly uh, bringing a new breed in? Um, what complements her might be a purebred bull, but it might be a composite. Uh, and then percentage of British versus continental. Um, given your resources, you might be able to handle, handle a bigger cow, a heavier weight female. Uh, so how much British versus continental is in your, in your rolling cow herd uh, may also influence how you mate this, this uh, two-year-old. So we'll just talk briefly about the evolution of, of livestock measurement, where we're headed and versus where we've been. And we used to scale and actual measures for a long, long time. Uh, but those really weren't comparable across breeds or across herds. Uh, we had it within herd ratios. We developed contemporary groups, which eventually uh, developed into estimated breeding values, which we more commonly refer to as EPDs or expected progeny differences. And now we're doing some things with multi-trait selection tools like dollar values or bioeconomic indexes. Uh, and those are simply math problems tied to the EPDs that already exist. And more recently, uh, we've got genomically enhanced EPDs in, in many of our breeds, and that's simply taking uh, locations on the bovine genome and relating them to uh, performance outputs that we know a lot about, and we add that to the accuracy or what we know uh, about the EPD itself. Uh, so they're not anything new from an EPD standpoint, they're just enhancing what we already have. So digging into that a little deeper, uh, the dollar values or profit indexes are complex math aimed at a simplified decision-making tool. Uh, so the dollar value is simply an EPD times a multiplier plus an EPD times another multiplier for as many traits as we need to put in that dollar value. 
So they are a dollar for dollar weighting of the economically relevant traits. Uh, so for instance, mature cow size has a negative economic impact from a feed standpoint versus weaning weight uh, has a positive economic impact. So those are figured into the dollar index. They are targeted for a producer's goals. Uh, for instance, uh, if you are retaining uh, all of your calves through the feedlot phase, then a, a carcass type of a dollar index is more what you need. If you're retaining heifers and selling all your bull calves at weaning, um, maybe a maternal index is what you're uh, looking for. They do vary among breeds. They are available on some composites. Uh, and the three I have listed here, the Hereford Baldy Maternal Index, Shorthorn British Maternal Index, and the Simmental API, uh, or all-purpose index, do basically the same thing. Basically the same thing. So if you have the, uh, one goal, you might be able to use all three of these uh, at those particular bull sales. They're not comparable uh, between breeds. They use the same as EPDs, uh, but you can use breed averages and things of that nature to find out where you rank within a particular breed uh, on dollar index. Uh, one of the common misconceptions is that composite cattle have an inherent advantage due to the heterosis that's in there. Well, composite EPDs are adjusted for heterosis effects, so they're subtracted out of the performance trait. Uh, so they are a, a good estimation of what we think we can uh, do it and and look at that composite animal as if they were a purebred. Uh, always try to remind uh, breeders to keep phenotype in your selection decisions. And a lot of uh, the simplification has caused producers to go to a sale and maybe look at only a couple of columns on the paper. For instance, in this example, we have birth weight and dollar beef for two Angus bulls. Well, if you're uh, retaining females in this situation, if you look at the two bulls, the bull on the left is a far different decision than the bull on the right. Uh, the left-hand bull, or bull A, much softer in his rib, a little more moderate in his appearance, uh, just looks more like a low-maintenance type of a cow. Bull on the right, even though his dollar B is the same, uh, is a much more extended, longer, longer spine type of an individual. Uh, but maybe a little harsher in his ribs. So there's a decision there on what you want your cows to look like. If you just look at the paper uh, and land on one bull or the other, your outcome might be very different. Some other considerations in bull selection, uh, especially for the young cow, be careful mating to extreme growth. She is still growing as a two and three year old. Uh, so if you mate to extreme growth, you might cause some calving issues down the line. Genetic defect risk. Uh, one of the greatest ways to limit your genetic defect risk is to rotate breeds. Uh, if you constantly rotate breeds, your risk is uh, diminished uh, quite a bit. And then also hide color. If you're buying replacement heifers or if you're buying bred females, uh, one of the ways to, to buy an unknown uh, and ensure maybe that the, uh, the Angus genetic defects might be in there is to buy a red hided cow. Um, you can use hide color to your advantage a bit. It doesn't eliminate the risk, but it does mitigate it some. Uh, if you're in a, a, a mating situation where you can utilize AI, you might consider sexed heifer semen. That can generate replacements faster. If you're in an expansion mode, that's a real option. There is a bit of a uh, offset in conception rate. Uh, there is a bit more expense involved as well, but it is still a good option. And the buy local movement. If you're in a fescue belt, uh, fescue adaptability is important, and you have to ask yourself the question, can you raise better replacement heifers than you can buy? So embracing heterosis. Uh, breed complementarity is pretty simple. The more unrelated the breeds, the better the advantage. Match your cows to your environment and your bulls to your market. Obviously, if you're training females in your own herd, this is a little different question or different scenario. And composite bulls can decrease calf crop uniformity and your heterosis advantage, but they do simplify things from a rotating breed standpoint, so make sure you consider that. And the final slide is just a, uh, a depiction of heterosis. Uh, the center of this spider web, if you will, is the first domesticated beef breed or the first domesticated beef animal, an estimation of it. So the more unrelated we can keep those breeds, the better. So hopefully these tools uh, have given you enough decisions decision aids to move your herd forward and help you expand your weekend.